did everybody have a chance to watch the video that I posted? <laughs> okay. So what we'll do, we're going to do a couple eye clicker questions associated with that sexual selection video, and then I'm going to go through one of the slides, and we'll have another kind of discussion about the, those Tungara frogs from Panama, and I'll try to ask you some questions about that. So, okay. So one of the questions has to do with the previous part of the lecture, and then the second question will have something to do with the video recording. So, okay. And we'll kind of go through these. Let's see. Uh, Whoops. So here's the first question. This has to do with that. I found out it's a crustacean. Okay, and females mate more often with males who have large nathopods, and that's the picture on the right. And the males with the larger nathopods have been shown to be better protectors of female during amplexus. So when you looked at that, remember the survival rate of females that were mated to the males with the larger nathopods tend to have lower predation rates. Smaller males result in higher predation rates of females. So the question is, which model of female choice or intersexual selection does this describe? A, good genes, B, the direct benefits model, C, the Fisherian runaway sexual, uh, runaway selection, or D, sensory bias? So, okay. So this wasn't on the video recording, but it was kind of from the previous lecture. This is always the danger of doing this at the beginning of class. So there's going to be another question. So. so this was the study where the females that chose the larger males had lower predation rates. So the question is, what, which model is this most consistent with? seconds and you'll have a chance to do the second one too okay okay so which model is it huh how many how many voted for B okay So, yeah, so some people chose, few people chose C and D, um, and I'm not going to get into those too much. The good genes is probably the closest model. Why is that, why is that not the best answer? So let's talk about what's the direct benefits model. What is, so when we're talking about direct benefits, what are we saying? That there's an immediate advantage to that female to choose those larger males, right? Because she has a lower predation rate, okay? So there's, there's, a, there's this sort of direct immediate benefit from her choosing those kinds of males because she will then, she herself will suffer lower predation. So that's kind of the, direct benefits usually deals with sort of an immediate benefit to females choosing particular kinds of males. Okay, 
The good genes is a little different. And this particular study didn't address good genes. It's still possible. You never know. But this study didn't really adjust the good genes because good genes really requires that she's choosing a trait, right? It could be male, larger nathopods have an, so, you know, maybe they're an indicator of genetic quality of the male. That's possible. But this study didn't really address that. So the good genes is kind of not immediate. It's a, you know, the fact she's choosing males with particular kinds of traits is an indicator of the quality of that male, and then her sons would inherit those sorts of traits. So that's a little different. Okay. We'll come back to the sensory bias because I'm going to talk about that Tungara frog example. That's an example of a sensory bias. Okay. So here is the, um, the last thing that was talked about in the sexual se selection recording lecture was on these bluegill sunfish. And so several studies have looked at the different reproductive behaviors of male blue bluegill sunfish. And there are different kinds of morphs or different male behaviors. Um, and they exhibit different strategies when attempting to fertilize the eggs. And the question here is which morph displays in the bluegill sunfish, there's a lot of competition among males, and males use different strategies to fertilize females' eggs, and they do it externally. Okay, this has external fertilization. And so which morph displays male male competition through cuckoldry? Everybody know what cuckoldry is? <laughs> okay. Well, cuckoldry is when you kind of, I shouldn't say this because then I'll give the answer. I'll just leave it at that. We'll come back to that. Exp competition through cuckoldry and sperm competition. So the question is, is it A, which are satellite males, B, which are sneaker males, C, which are paternal males, and D, which are territorial males. So, so which of these mating behaviors show that kind of strategy? Okay. Go ahead and stop there. What's the answer to this one? B. B is always the answer to every question. Okay. So these are the sneaker males. So if you go back, let me just look, see how everybody did. Okay. Well, we had a range of range of answers there, and it probably had to do with what cuckoldry is. Okay. So you can Google what cuckoldry is. Okay. But these are these sneaker males. So let's kind of go through, let me just kind of go through, just briefly touch on what happens here. So this is, this is what these males do. And I didn't touch too much on the satellite males. They tend to be at fairly low frequency in the populations, but there are two different kinds of strategies that males employ. One are parentals. 
And they can they build these nests. They're brighter. They're highly territorial. They invest a lot in aggression, defending the nest, and those sorts of things. And so there are often other males that are nearby that they're you know they maintain these exclusive territories. Females come to visit there and they lay their eggs. And this male tries to fertilize their eggs. What do the sneakers do? They're the cuckolds. Okay, so they try to get access to those eggs. They're smaller. You can see they're less aggressive. They don't have the bright coloration either as much, so they tend to have less bright coloration. They're much smaller. And what they attempt to do is they kind of ha hang out in these bushes, and when a female comes to visit here, they try to sneak in and quickly dump their sperm onto the eggs and try to get as many <laughs> fertilizations as they can. Guess what these parental males try to do when these sneakers come by? They try to... You know, they try to keep them away, okay? But a lot of times, it depends on how many sneaker males. If you've got four or five, you know, trying to, you know, going in at one time, it's sometimes hard for the parental male to deal with them, okay? So these sneaker males are smaller, less aggressive, sneak in and deposit sperm, okay? And what you have here is, in this case of external fertilization, you, you got a potentially sperm from a parental male and a sneaker male trying to fertilize those eggs, right? So how do they, how do, they do this? What do sneaker males do? Do they produce a lot of sperm? Yeah, so the key is, and that's what that next slide kind of showed, what happens after, this isn't really copulation because it's external, but after they deposit their sperm, what the sneakers do, they have much higher sperm density. So each packet of sperm that they deposit onto the eggs has a much, much higher density than the parental males, okay? That comes at a trade-off, though, doesn't it? What's the trade-off? They don't live as long, okay? So the parental male, the sperm longevity, I think this is in seconds, I don't know, this, I assume this is in seconds or minutes possibly. So sperm longevity is much, much longer in parental males than in sneaker males. So again, this is kind of this, these are, again, kind of classic trade-offs. They produce a lot of sperm, but they don't live as long. So the question you really want to know is, what would you really want to know about these two behaviors? Which one fertilizes more eggs in general? What do you think the answer is? Yeah, the parentals in general. Okay, so in general, the idea here is that, again, these parentals probably get most of the fertilizations, right, because they try to exclude sneakers. But the other thing is, this is often just viewed as a, an alternative male mating strategy. And what do you think, if you had to hypothesize, what do you think these males are? Yeah, did somebody say younger? Yeah, so this could be kind of a plastic behavior, right? That these tend to be older, <coughs> the more territorial parentals, right? And these often can, are often, these often tend to be younger individuals, okay? Okay. So again, so I kind of spent some, spent some time on that. Then the other thing I talked about, I think what I'm gonna do how about I give you a homework problem, homework essay? How's that sound? Because I think it, it might, I know it's on the exam. Sometimes it's, I think doing some practice essays and things like that might be helpful, okay? So what I'm gonna do, hopefully I'll get through all my lecture today. What I'll, what I'll do is I'll present sort of two essays, right? And you can answer either one of them. And you can turn it, we'll turn it in in class on Tuesday. So I'll email it all to you and put it on Moodle and all that sort of stuff. So I'll give you a choice of two essays, one dealing with this, okay, and then another one dealing with uh, the stuff I talk about, the evolution of sociality. I'll give you a chance to choose either one. And these will, be, these will be graded. What do you want it worth? And you can work with, I don't care, you can work with each other, turn in your own answer, turn in your own answers separately on class on Tuesday, but I'll give you five or ten points. This will be towards your homework grade, okay. What did we, what was, what happened here? These are these things in Panama. I sent you a little video of them, and Mike Ryan is a guy at UT Austin that's been studying these for 30 years and some of the best work on this. But what, what happened here? This is kind of weird. Yeah. So kind of bef in the previous slide, some species who don't have males, some females in species who don't even have the chuck, they prefer them, right? 
and this was the sensory bias idea, that there's something about that chuck that stimulates the female sensory system, and even though their males don't have it, they actually prefer it, and this is what's called sensory bias. So that's what was kind of shown there. So, and then what you get, you get a chuck that evolves, right? And then it can get elaborated. How did it get elaborated? And this is a, this is a frog in Panama called the Tungara frog. It's a species that's pretty much found only in Panama, parts of Costa Rica. And the Tungara frog, it also has, what, else, what did it do? Yeah. It gets longer or it produces more chucks. So some males produce no chucks, they just whine. Some produce one, two, three, or four. So there's a lot of variability in the population in terms of the number of the chuck, number of chucks that these males produce. What do females prefer? And I didn't get into all the details of how that was measured, and I don't really care. What did, what did females prefer? What, what kind of males? The ones with more chucks. So they really, he did all these paired experiments where you give a choice between a female one chuck or four chucks. They always prefer males with four chucks. It's inevitable. If you give them five or six, which they don't have, they really like those even more, okay? So these females sort of escalate this male signal to a high level. Does it come at any cost? Yep. So not only do female frogs like them, guess what else likes them? And there are great videos of this if you want to see this. These frog-eating bats love them too. And it turns out they can actually echolate and probably locate these males that are producing longer, more chucks more easily. So there's a much higher predation rate of bats by bats on the males that produce more chucks. Okay. So one of the questions I'm going to ask you, ask you, and I'll write it out, and it'll be a little more formal. So what I'm going to ask you about is, um, um, I haven't even formulated it myself. But anyway, let me. I'll think about it. So what I'm going to say, what I'm going to ask you about is, you know. When you think about this, even if male frogs with four chucks have a higher predation rate, could it lead to the evolution leading to males producing a lot of these chucks, right? So the question is, even though they survive poorly, what kind of benefit could outweigh that high mortality? And so I'll, we'll talk about that. And this is going to, I hope, lead nicely into the next lecture in terms of how we talk about reproductive success and all these other things. So. What I'll do is I'll present that as one of the essays. I think I have it on an old exam, so I'll probably just pull it from an old exam. And then I'll give you another essay for homework. And that'll, those will be turned in on Tuesday. Okay. So if you haven't had a chance, I know it's always hard. If you haven't had a chance, go and I think it's about a 15 to 18 minute video on the sexual selection recording. So make sure you listen to that because that's going to be part of the exam material. So the other thing is, remember, this is a trait. This call is under both what we call is kind of under both sexual selection and natural selection. I'll talk about kind of the interaction or tension between those two and what it can lead to, and that's kind of the question I'll ask. Okay. Whoops. So today's, let me, actually, let me, let me stop this recording. It's a good place to stop.